It gives me great pleasure to um, welcome Carl Berge, um, who's originally from Switzerland, um, but is currently with Wisconsin, um, and has had um, a long history of working with um, therapeutic hoof trimming and looking at lameness in the dairy herd and how to prevent that. Um, He's been involved with training both on a farm level, veterinarian level, and a hoof trimmer and consultant level in over 40 countries around the world. So it's great to have these international speakers coming. He's currently based in Wisconsin, um, and his personal mission is to save cows. Um, so I'd like to... Um, Welcome him now. There is um, still a few spaces on his um, workshop on farm this afternoon. If you're interested in going to that, um, then you need to see reception um, during the lunch break. Okay, that's great. So I'd like to hand over to Carl. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here in the UK and, and kind of hang around you guys, have a beer, talk about cows, talk about sightseeing and all of that. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about reducing lameness because it seems like wherever I travel in the world, lameness is an issue. But there's a solution. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk much about trimming because there's not enough time. I'm going to talk about how we're going to get there, a little bit of background a little bit about the industry that I see all, all around the world. So, there we go. I'll get back to this in a little bit, okay? It's one of those conversation pieces. But this is actually a milking parlor. Thanks to these two guys here on the, on the right. Okay, where is my pointer here? On the left, huh? Out of battery. Uh, two guys on the left that give us a fantastic or brilliant tour. Uh, it's just one of it. And the guy that took the picture, he was even crazier, wasn't he? I mean, he come up. He says, "You want to take a picture?" Sure, we'll take a picture. But anyway. This is a fresh cow. She's lame. And we, I see that way too often. I say that way too often. And for the vets in the, in, the, in, the, in the crowd, good business. Really good business. Because you have DA, you have ketosis, you have repro problems all the way down. Okay? So, so I'm, I'm going to bring this picture up later on again. What the agenda today is, we'll talk a little bit about the prevalence hoof trimming status, background, and then time functional trimming. I've been doing time functional trimming for about 14 years. Currently, I work, I trim about 500 to 600 cows a month. In between my travels, I have about 12 farms. And our lameness generally is in that 5 to 12 percent range. Okay, so we're going to talk about what is time trimming and then the benefits and we're going to conclude. <coughs> Lameness originates from claw horn lesions, which sole ulcers and white lines are the main lesions. Okay, toe ulcers, sole fracture or heel ulcers, and then on the other side, digital dermatitis. I think with good functional trimming, we can also prevent digital dermatitis or help reduce the incidence. Foul is a little more difficult, but I think also a, a well-trimmed cow can do that. So the prevalence here, this is, uh, I'm going to bring some more up, but this was a study done in 2010 in Alberta, and before they went into the study, we told them you're going to find about 17 to 20% sole ulcers, 
you're going to find about 17 to 20 percent white lines. You're going to have about 50 percent digital dermatitis. For me, what, what I see here as an example, what's too high is the toe ulcers. Toe ulcers, in my opinion, is a strict result of over trimming. Strict result of over trimming. That's where, that's where they come on. Or too much wear with the grazing cows. Like you go, I go to New Zealand, Australia, a lot of toe ulcers because they wear their tires out. Okay? So, but with that, the status of hoof trimming, I want to get into that a little bit because wherever I go, US, uh, UK, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, everywhere. The problem we find is when it comes to hoof trimming, there's not enough accountability. We've got people that are certified, but there's still no accountability. The other thing I'm seeing out there that is on many farms, abnormal has become normal. We walk onto a farm, all kinds of lame cows, we, we mobility scored 50, 60 percent and the farmer sees half of them or a third of them. And that's been proven in some of the studies that were done around uh, Marcy Anderson, Minnesota did a study, locomotion on farms and they found, or mobility scoring, that the producers actually only found one third of the person that would come on the farm. And I understand. I was, I was milking cows before because producers have many things going. Calves, feeding, business, all of that, employees. But the thing about this is we have to have a plan. I'll talk about that plan a little bit later. We accept lameness. We say, oh, it's normal to have lame cows. I was in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. We had 5% lameness and the manager said, I want to cut that in half in the next year. We did. We did. All we did is we tr made sure the trimmers were doing the right thing. We put some other action plans in place. A year later, we had 250 lame cows out of, uh, of 7,000. And that's with good records. The biggest thing here is lame cows do not recover and end up with slaughter, animal welfare, right? That's, it's the buzzword, wherever you go. The consumer is always right. I just picked that off the internet last night. Anybody has been on YouTube watching the Canadian video of Chilliwack Cattle Company? I, I was there eight years ago on that farm. And I had to walk out of the place because it was, it was so bad. It took eight years for it to come, to come onto YouTube. It's going to happen other places again because today with a cell phone, anybody can walk through there, take a video. 30 seconds, it's on YouTube. So we, we really have to do, be more careful. And it's, it's all about perception. So. Next year's total cow race car for the meeting, okay? And, and the reason I put this up here is because of this. Hoof trimming has become a race all over, all over the world, okay? We got to have faster trimming shoots. We got to get more cows done in a day. But this is the problem, there are few drivers that can finish the race and win. That's the problem. Very few guys can do that and be successful. So going on with the next one here, there we go. The reason I got this picture on here, how many guys have been to World Dairy Expo? Okay, some of you guys have been. Big, big cow show in Madison, Wisconsin. My son is 29 right now. When he was six, we exhibited at World Dairy Expo. This guy from Texas come in. I had a hand crank manual shoot, and my son was standing there, and the guy says, this thing would never work down here in Texas. And I says, how come? Oh, he says, down here, the boys come in at 9 o'clock. By 1 o'clock, they have 120 cows through. And I says, do they look at the feet? 
And, and, and my son said, Dad, 120 cows. You've never done 120 cows. How can, and that's a little six-year-old, okay? So, too many times I find the quality of hoof trimming is measured by how many cows I can get through the chute. A young guy comes in the field, great young guys, learn the skills, goes to the larger farm, how many cows can he do in a day? Instead of asking, what can we do to prevent the lame cows? See the difference? See the difference at the end? Because for me, if the cow doesn't come around, it doesn't matter if I run 120 cows through, if she ends up at slaughterhouse. So, so the thing here, the measuring stick, we're, we're going to have to change that measuring stick because it can be done. It, we, we can do it. We, we have the tools to do it. We have the knowledge to do it. Okay? So functional trimming. This is a pretty normal foot. This is functional trimming. See, most of you guys would say, oh, there's a spot there, right? Wonder if there's not a problem there. Nobody ever asked, was she lame? If the feet are not completely white, we haven't done a good job. 85% of the cows that I see trimmed when I travel around are over trimmed. Okay? So, I'll get a little more into this afterwards, but hoof trimming and hoof trimming errors. Okay? A very good example. Guess what? This guy goes to the hairdresser. He gets his money's worth all the way. Right? When she goes, she pays for the looks. Right? You pay for your looks. You don't pay for the hair on the floor. See, for you, most, most, of, most of you guys, you're paying for the chips on the floor. That's, that's the norm. That's the norm. We have to start thinking different. Okay? So, what are some of the, some of the things that are happening most generally? Trim and toes too short. Okay, what's going to happen is toe ulcers. Chronic toes or necrotic toes. Necrotic toes are the strict results, a high percentage of over trimming. Or maybe too much wear in a grazing situation where we wear the tires out. Okay, the next one is, is, this, is a, this is the inner claw here. The inner claw is like sacred, the heel. Can't touch it. And too many times, if it's not nice and white, we haven't done the job. So what's happening is we, we, we can't balance out, so the outside claw still care, uh, bears more weight. So we haven't done anything. We haven't done anything to prevent it. Okay? So, what happens here is this is before trimming, and if we do the right job, we bring that angle back. You know, calves are born with good foot angles. But once they come to cows, sometimes we're, 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 there, there's no foot angle there anymore because it's all in the chip pile. So it's a real important part. And I've made my mistakes in the past. I over-trimmed. But as the farms have gotten larger, I had to adjust what I was doing to, to, you know, to, to succeed. So, this is another one, nice and white. The guy did a nice job going in between the toe, taking that curl out. Great. Okay? Great job. So this is what I want to point out. Every claw, in my opinion, you guys were lucky last night because over at the bar, every chair had four legs. For me, every claw has three points, three legs. If you take one of them away, you won't be drinking all night because you'll be on, on the bottom of the bar, not on the top. Same thing with the foot. The wall comes all the way around from the back comes one third of the way back. It's kind of like the corner support. Okay? It's kind of like the corner support. This is, where the, this is where the necrotic toes come from. 
going in between the toes. I used to do it. But the more we do it, the more the toes curl because the body compensates for over trimming. When you, when you over trim, the body says, hey, something is happening down here, produce more horn. And then in the meantime, we get an infection. Cows that come lame two or three days after trimming or five days after trimming, it's generally it's always an over trimming issue. You know, so, pretty, okay, very pretty. I was at this farm, major lameness issue. Foot trimmer was there. Talking with the farmer, he was trimming over there and I said, see what he's doing? I took the picture with my wide angle lens. I said, so, how would you like it if I come into your shed and thin all the poles out half, half ways, throughout, all the way around? He says, well, that would be fucking stupid. <laughs> and I said, what do you think this is? You know, what do you think this is? Because look at how many guys would go in here and, 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 and you know, do that. And this is where those problems come from. Non-healing non -healing lesions, white line lesions. Or, or again, necrotic toes. So, and then here, this is probably not so much anymore here, but you still see it, I call it the rooftop trim, okay? How many of you guys would put a, a building up, but instead of making the walls vertical, you put them on like that? Nobody would do it because it would collapse. And then again, the last one here, thinning the toes too thin, results. And this is what the most important part is about functional trimming. The toe region needs five millimeters minimum of sole thickness to stay healthy. If we don't have five millimeters, we're gonna have toe ulcers, we're gonna have whatever, whatever happens. Things are gonna happen and that, that's a problem today on the large farms with sand bedding with wear. We have, or, or on the large grazing farms that walk too much because once we wear this out up here, we don't have, we don't have any margin. We, in the internal part, the corium gets spruced, it produces unhealthy horn, and the next thing we have a big problem. And you can see here, this is what it turns out a lot of times. Either bone infection, necrotic toes, that's kind of the, that's kind of the way things happen. So, functional trimming, the way I teach it, I learned it, I learned it from Peter Klosterman. And all I did is, I made a small adaption. I do less on the medial claw because after several years I found it didn't matter how much I modeled the medial claw. If the medial claw got diseased, it never had to do anything with the trimming. It always had to do with the management and environment on the medial claw. Because how many, how many sole ulcers do we see on medial claws? Rare, rare, okay? And, and, and so, so for me, I can sleep very well every night by not even doing anything with the media cloth. It's the right length and the right sole thickness. If I can shape it so it functions better, it's more perpendicular, we'll do it. But less is more, less is more. Most of the media cloths are over trimmed. Even like if we put, have to put a block on this one, I would never use a trimming wheel to clean, the to clean the foot off because you're taking too much away. The medial claw already is always at a deficit. That's why the outside one has the problem. Look at how much bigger that outside one is. Okay? And there's another one. So, functional trimming for me, what I call, what I do is it's just a new app. <coughs> just like a new app on the iPad or on the, on, it doesn't matter, on the, on the, on the Android pad. We're just, we're just doing, in some cases, less, in other cases, more. Because after a while, I figured out, okay, with the outside claw modeling, all the problems are always on that outside claw. The more I modeled, the more time I bought. And when we model more, we put the weight more onto the wall, 
that's where it's supposed to be anyway. As soon as it's on the soul, trauma happens, hormone production increases. Next thing is we have a soul ulcer. Some, some of your older cows that have had problems, they might need to be remodeled every uh, 8 to 12 weeks. You know, every 8 to 12 weeks. I worked at a large farm last fall, 6,000 cows. We trained one of, their, one of their managers that oversees the trimmers. And I said, all I want you guys to do in early lactation, model the outside claw. No trimming, because we had good wear. They've always, they had, they had lame cows, not an excessive amount. He calls me up four months later, he says, Carl, he says, it's working. We're up two liters of milk. Ding, 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 ding. 6,000 cows and two, two liters of milk. Guess what? A lot of money. A lot of money every, 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 every day. That's every day. By, by doing less, by doing less. So, I'm going back to the trimming. You guys, how many of you guys listened to Tom yesterday? Okay, about milking cows. What's, how many turns per hour should we have? Turns per hour in a, in a, in a puddle like that. Six, seven? Would you, would, you hire, would you hire a milker that would give you six turns, seven turns an hour in that parlor? Would you? Huh? Okay. The same thing comes to hoof trimming. Six turns an hour, you're probably not going to get the job done. You know, Tom, I, I talked to Tom earlier, he said four Four and a half, five, if they do a really good job, you know? And the point I want to make to is just again, guess what? The guy that writes out the check at the end of the day is the captain of the ship. He's in, he's in control. We have a lot of control. The producers have a lot of control. The consultants have a lot of control to advise the producers. So going into the real stuff now, when we look around, 20 to 25% of dairy cows are lame in North America, that's Cook. Study out of Wales, the mean prevalence of scores, uh, mobility scores two and three across the study farms was 36.8% in Wales. Another one here, early lactation lameness sink, uh, significantly decreases pregnancy rate, increases, increased calling and death. Pretty good study. Cook in, in 2007, transition, calving, and heat stress change, resting behavior. And lame cows appear to rest more after calving and likely eat less, making them better candidates for what I talked about at the beginning. That lame cow there, we saw at the beginning. So, another thing. Mobility score, zero versus two, or locomotion score, one versus three. Longer lying times, three days pre and post calving. This, this was a pretty good study done on a, on a commercial farm. I knew the farm, lots of lameness issues. High turnover rate, 40%, 45% turnover rate. And what, what they found, what Calderon and Cook found, greater number of lying bouts, shorter lying bouts, and ketosis, great risk with ketosis. These guys battled all the time. So transition and calving, we know that lameness triggers. So we're going to talk a little bit about the triggers. Guess what? The last three days, eight weeks from now, six to eight weeks from now, you guys will have, well, you guys have some lameness that results from the, the last three days. For the cow, when it gets above 18 degrees, it's hot. And we don't realize that. Put them in the holding, go in the holding pen once when you got 250 cows in the holding pen on a day like yesterday. I wasn't even in the holding pen and I was hot. Okay? So six weeks, eight weeks from today. Generally, lameness happens 45 to 60 days after a trigger period. 
So what we learned from this is we need to figure out the trigger periods and when it comes to time trimming, that's how we're gonna set it up. The other thing is, like when we have a, a, a trigger period, heat stress, calving, high production, things don't heal, the, the cows don't recover as well because they're working on other things. They're working on putting milk in the tank or they're trying to keep themselves cool, okay? So, very good example here in one of my farms, uh, and they was pretty all the way through in 2011 and 12. So in 2012, we had a, a July. This was the lameness in, in, when we trimmed in July. Look at what happened August and September. For me, August and September are always the highest lameness, lameness month. And we've proven that. It has to, all to do with the heat stress. Big cows, cows stand more. Interestingly, in 2012, we had a really hot March. We had like four days in March, they were like almost 30 degrees. Cows weren't ready for that. And nobody had their cooling system, hardly anybody had their cooling system in place because, well, it's only March. Look at what happened in May, two months later. Okay? Now, the thing here is we, we didn't, uh, and what I can, the green here would be ditchy, uh, the, the, uh, the dark green, the light green is white lines, the, the dark gray is hemorrhaging, and the top, the light gray is soul ulcers. Now the thing I'm gonna show you here right now, and that's very good pattern. After the heat period, look at what happened over here with the soul ulcers. We had increase in, in hemorrhaging, the gray, and the light grain goes up. So at the end of the summer, we're up on soil ulcers. And that just has to do because the extended period of the cow standing. And probably some of the metabolic issues, anything that's related with heat stress. But good information. So I wore my dollar tie. I didn't have an a, a English pound tie, so I had to wear my dollar tie. But it's all about money at the end of the day, OK? Lameness in early lactation, for me, lowers peak production, delays reproduction, or some t and premature exit from the herd. Okay, what about camel milking? Now, you guys, it's pretty interesting. They have to leave the camels on the calves for 28 days. Otherwise, they won't let the milk down in the milking parlor. Think about that once. It's pretty interesting to see. So, what is time trimming for me? And this is my definition, to perform functional trimming at the most advantageous times, optimizing claw health, cow health, and preventing lameness episodes. That's what it is. So I'm looking at the stress periods, right? Calving is a stress period. Heat stress is a, a stress period. Okay? Changes are, are stress periods. So I got one of my farms here. This, this is just days in milk. And, and at this particular farm, we don't do a good job in early lactation. We have too, many, too much ditchy, the green, when, when they come through calving and transition. And we have, as you can see here, it goes 60 to 90 days before it finally reduces. This is like counts. This is a 600 cow dairy. It, it really doesn't matter. I could have brought another dairy. It, it would be the same way if we do the same thing. So here we don't trim every dry cow. And for me, this is what it is. is for me, calving is the most stressful period of a cow of a heifer. If she's on good feet, we've got one thing out of the way. It's like that race car. If it's got good tires on it, it's going to get to the end of the race. But if, if it's not, it's going to happen the other way. So this is one of my other dairies. Same thing. This is a 600 cow dairy also. Maybe five cases of lameness in, in the first 30 days. I don't want to touch the cows three weeks before and three we or four weeks after calving. Why mess with them? They've got, they've got all the other things to do, you know? They've got to get into a system. And the reason these things are higher here 
is because we actually do the lactation trims, okay? So this here at this particular farm, it's a sand barn, we start a mid-lactation trim about 135 days to 170 days. And that's why these two piles are higher. And then this is our dry cod trim. So we're seeing more, we're recording more. And one of the things here, you, you can see here really, the biggest thing is very, uh, there's probably four soil ulcers on this uh, 600 cod area. Four soil ulcers. And that's in a, in a year's period. In mid-lactation, we had a couple of them here. You can see here, no soil ulcers in the first 100 days at all. We probably had two or three of them in 90 to 150 days, and, and, and not, a, not a big problem. Ditchy here is higher because I record five stages of it. All mine are higher because even the chronic stages are recorded because I think with digital dermatitis, if we don't take an integrated approach, look at all the stages and the information is coming out, even to the UK here, that's the only way we can control it. We gotta look at all the stages, not just the, the acute stage at the, that we treat with, uh, with the antibiotic. Okay, so time trimming, it prevents the development of claw horn lesions and it optimizes claw shape during trigger phases and increases profitability. So, just like I said before, for me, on my farms, 100% of the heifers are trimmed. Now, I don't want you to go home and trim 100% of your heifers. You only do that if you got a good trimmer. Trimming heifers is delicate work. If you mess her up and give her a toe ulcer, she has it for the rest of the life. Okay? So, so from that end of it, it has to be done right. And there is less to take off. For me, see, no lameness transpires during the transition to pre and postpartum period. Because what, I, what my records show is, every time I have a lame cow in the first 30, 40 days, she generally is not around for another lactation. O on the bigger farms, it just doesn't happen. She's gone. You know, if we've got plenty of heifers to come in, that might be okay, okay? And the other thing I find is, I don't, you know, I've trimmed them before calving. Sometimes you just have, to, or if they're lame, but we don't try to do any trimming in that three weeks. Once they get in the close-ups until about 30 days after, we won't touch them if we don't have to. Even our high-maintenance cows, we try to do it before, wait till afterwards, only deal with urgent, urgent care, with acute lame cows or with lame cows. Higher returns. I think we prevent a lot more of the uh, claw horn lesions. We reduce urgent care, so we reduce those emergency cows when we do time trimming. I got a little more about the schedule. The other thing I'm seeing is reducing the chronic lame cows because when we do time trimming, we're on the farm more often, we'll, we'll have a look at those cows. There's cows I see every eight weeks. I was at the farm on Friday. There's probably half a dozen cows, fifth, six, seven lactation. Every eight weeks they come to me, model them out again, balance them out, send them on their way. And they keep milking, they keep reproducing, that's why they're still in the herd. And he said, every month this guy sells 15 to 20 heifers over to the sale barn or the young cows to the sale barn and he just doesn't like it. Yeah, she's kind of ornery, we'll sell her, somebody, let it, somebody else have, her prob uh, have the problem, okay? And when we're there on the farm, more often we, we can take care of those high maintenance cows. A couple of years ago I was on a farm, very well managed farm. The guy brought the cow out, she looked like she was milking a lot. And he says, Carl, he says, all I want you to do is make sure she's good for the next two months till he come back. I says, why? Oh, he says, she's milking 210 pounds on twice a day. All I want to make sure she's okay. Little modeling, balance her out, send her on her way. She went out the, sh out the trimming chute over to the feed bunk and started eating, making more milk. The other thing I think is we have a much better chance of doing uh, and keeping Ditchy under control because we can treat the early lesions that we should anyway, but we have better foot angles, the heels are more out of the, out of the, out of the manure, and we know that manure plays a huge factor, hygiene plays a huge factor with, with uh, with uh, digital dermatitis. 
The only whole hurt trims I've done in the past is smaller hurts, where it wasn't justifiable for me to go there three or four times a year. Everybody else is, is on a two months, every two months or a five week schedule, and that's just so I'm there more often. We do a better job and always make sure that those, those close up cows, those calving cows are good. The thing here is about, I don't think the whole herd trims in channel are the best for the cow because if she was trimmed four months ago and she's going through calving tomorrow, in some, for some cows it's too long. That four months, she's already overgrown. Yeah, is she gonna be lame right after calving? No, but every time she's overgrown, she's going to that trigger factor period, she's gonna get damaged. And that damage gets, gets worse, okay? And I, again, I don't like to trim them during close up. High maintenance cows just need more attention. If we wanna keep the cows in the herd, there's cows that need, they need to see somebody every eight weeks. And if you see, if they every eight weeks get a little more model on the lateral claw, I never put blocks on. If I let them go an extra months, next time I come back, that I already put blocks on. And one of the things I'm finding is I'm getting darn good on estimating how long those cows can go. It just comes from experience, comes from watching things, comes from you know, records. For me, sometimes the, the whole herd approach is a lazy manager's approach because oh, we just don't want to mess, mess with the cows all the time. You know, it doesn't take much to, to sort out. To, a lot of guys have sort gates. My guys use the headlocks. They lock the headlocks so when we're starting out, bring the 15 cows out quick. And what we see is every time, day later, our milk production is up in every place. Because we, don't, we take 10, 15 cows at a time, about an hour's worth, hour and a half worth, they go, they're back, back of food. Too many times, sometimes we're picking out too many cows, they don't have water, access to water and, 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 and feed, and doesn't work out. I think sometimes it benefits the trimmer more, but the other thing I see is hoof trimmer fatigue. There's only so many cows that you can do a good job at when you're going. There's only so many cows. And, and we always say it's about 50 to 70 cows per trimmer because after that, the quality goes down. Or to speak, if, if you're still trimming the same speed at four o'clock in the afternoon that you did at nine o'clock in the morning, I guarantee you, you over trim. It's just not possible, even, even I can't do it. In the afternoon, I'm like two cows an hour slower than I am in the morning. Even I wanna get down and get home, okay? And then the other thing happens is, is when we do too many cows, guess what? We don't do a good job of therapeutic trimming because okay, we've got a, another 120 cows waiting. We gotta, we gotta get through those cows. Why do you think we have necrotic toes and chronic white lines? Just because we don't do an adequate job of the, of the therapeutic trimming when, when we actually should. Because a, a, a good white line is not gonna be trimmed out in, in 30 seconds or two minutes. Some of them take eight, 10 minutes if you wanna do them right, but the recovery is always there. There's not a cow that doesn't recover unless she has deep digital sepsis, unless she has infection into the joint or the bone. Every cow recovers. Blocks are amazing things. I use almost no, no bandages at all. And if I use bandages, less than 24 hours, they're off. Blocks, get them up in the air, do the right thing at trimming, and it works. The other thing that we see is when we do too many cows, more chronic lame cows, okay? So, the other thing I think is, is a lot of you guys do on farm emergency lame cow work, which everybody needs to do. Everybody needs to put, deal with lame cows on a daily basis, not on a weekly basis. Lame cows, I don't, I don't find any guys that treat mastitis once a week. Yeah, it doesn't happen, right? So, so it's really important that, that we look after that. So, see, if we, if we don't follow up on some of those cows, I don't expect my producers to be the best therapeutic trimmers because they don't do that many of them. If they do a lame cow, guess what? She always comes to see sees me. 
Sometimes I adjust the block, trim them out some more. Sometimes I put a new block on. It doesn't matter. We're all, we're all in it to save the cow, to make it better, you know? But if, if I'm on the farm twice a year, fat chance. I can't, I can't get it done, you know? So then we have more of those, the chronic white lines and the chronic toes. So the, the time trimming guarantee, every cow and heifer passes through close-up, calving, early lactation, and all those other things with the best possible claw shape. And that's why I'm coming back to this cow. The chances that she's gonna have a DA or ketosis. You wanna, wanna bet some dollars, right? For the nutritionists, for the vets here in, in here. I was to one, I six on the cow dairy the other day. We trim every heifer, every dry cow. I says, how many DAs, do, oh, somebody was with me, a guy from China. He says, how many DAs did you have in the last year? He says, one. Doing probably 95 pounds per head per day. One DA. But we're very, doesn't matter. Every dry cow gets looked at. I go there every five weeks. We run the dry cows through it. We run all the spring and heifers through it. We, and we have a very low incidence of ditchy because if they, it, that, that dry cow or that transition period, if they're in good shape, we, I think we keep ditchy infections lower. We can keep it under control because we put them up on their toes, less stress on the feet, because research has shown today when those outside claws are overgrown, the incidence of digital dermatitis goes up. That's, that's some, it's not, uh, it's not a, we don't have a, a p-value on, on, on it, but there's definitely a difference. Okay, so, for me, every spring and heifer is trimmed eight to three weeks before calving. You know, sometimes it's two weeks. For me, when I get onto a farm, I get onto your farm if you have cows. You have cows? Yep. First thing I'm gonna go when I walk on your farm, I'm going in a close-up pen. If the close-up pen feet don't look good, I don't have to go any further. I know right where the problem is. And then when I start there, because when I start there, everything will come into place. Those are my most important cows, you know? So, and then, Trim, you know, depending on the situation, every farm has a different environment, management, it depends what it's doing. But for me, functional trimming is not turning the grind around, taking away. It's making an assessment, do I need to take anything off or do I leave it on? You're talking all four feet? Uh, twice I do all four feet. The third time I just look at them. If I do a third trim, like, my sand hurts, we generally do, do two trims, except the older cows. And my mattress hurts, what, I, what we'll do is, we'll do it. Uh, generally, I go in every farm every five weeks, we look at all the dry cows, okay? So every five weeks, I have a new dry cow, dry cow pen, generally. If one is in there longer, usually she gets her back feet lifted and modeled out again, just to have it ready. Then, what, uh, two of the hurts now, we start at 80 days because mattresses, overcrowded, high milk production, we do a full trim at 80 days. Just again, and a lot of times it's not much, model the lateral claws, and then we bring them in again at 200 days. Now my sand hurts, 125 days, we're doing perfect, we're doing great. We start picking them 125 to 150 days, and really, uh, except for the older high maintenance cows, okay? So housing, environment, management, production, all of that plays a role. <coughs> Basically, that you guys got that in the paper. So with my high maintenance cows, if a cow had a sole ulcer for me, and it was like a, a two or a three, automatically she'll be on a high maintenance schedule. She's either gonna be on an eight week or a 12 week schedule on those back feet. And then I just look at the front feet. I mean, I got records when she was trimmed last, I don't record when I trim the front feet. I just, if they look good, I let them go. There, there's no point. I'm not as lazy as the Dutch, okay? And the Dutch says, ah, it's too hard to do front feet. We won't, just won't do them. No, I, I pick them up, okay? This is what we found was with trimming heifers. 
two to four point better feet and leg score throughout the productive life. If I would tell one of my guys, we tried to do a study to do some heifers, no trimming, to do a comparison. None of my guys said, oh, hell, we're, you, you go somewhere else. We don't want to do it. Because look at here. When I first started it about 14, 15 years ago, I had a farmer, he had 25 heifers, or 28 heifers. We trimmed 14 of them because I didn't have any more time because he had a date that night. We let the rest of them go. A year later, 1,200 kg difference between the ones that were trimmed and the ones that were not. Same, same feeding, same management, same environment. Now, does it always turn out that much? At that place, it did, you know? At that place, it did. I mean, even today, I'm gonna tell you right now, is if you can prevent digital dermatitis in your heifers, if a heifer doesn't have digital dermatitis the day she calves, she's about 750 kg milk ahead at the end of the first lactation over the one that has digi. 750 kg. A lot, a lot of milk, okay? So with the heifers, see what I'm saying again, if it's not done right, there's a lot of trimmers, I wouldn't let them touch my heifers. Because, you know, if you guys want to do it yourself, all you do is model the lateral claw. And maybe if, if we can shorten up the inside toe a little bit in the back. That's all really that you do. So, when we do time function trimming, farm with lameness, when we have lame cows, I only have so much time on the farm, you only have so much time, right? When you're dealing with lame cows, you can't get to the prevention. We don't, you know, we only have so many time slots. There's only so much, right? You want to see your husband a little bit too, right? So, lameness prevention suffers, overall farm increases, and right away we have more chronic lame cows. Because we're always playing catch up. And I, I've been there. I've been there. I, I had, Last year, I told the farmer, I said, okay, I'm just going to have to do less traveling for a month, come here a couple extra times to catch up. And once we caught up, ditchy went down, lame cows went down, you know, all of that. Oh. There we go. And for me here, I put up there, so for me, on a, on a really good farm, like where we're a good environment, 2.5 trims, for me is maintenance. That means 2.5 checkups per year, okay? On a higher maintenance farm, you need to go with 3.5. I mean, that can vary a little bit, but look at here. Let's take 500 cows. And that's in a, in a sand herd and a low, high, that's 25 cows per week, okay? That's my maintenance. On, a, on another, it's 37, so 12 more cows per week on a mattress herd on 500 cows but it all pays back, just that extra, that extra effort. Maybe it's 2.2 and 3.2 or something like that. The other thing here is when I'm there more, how many of you guys recheck lame cows? How do you know if they don't recover if you, if you recheck them? I recheck some all, all the time. I got a couple of farms. I, I, gotta, I gotta make sure they work, it works for me because otherwise I can tell you how to do it, right? But we don't do enough free checks on the, on the lame cows. We put the block on, yeah, she'll be okay. Six weeks later, she's lame again, right? <clears throat> okay, so, and the other thing is when we recheck her, then we can record her and put her in the dairy program and we can put her on the schedule we wanna put her on. A lot of times, how many times do you guys put on a block and after like a week, the block was on like that, right? No rest on the other side anymore. What's the purpose of the block? It's probably gonna cause a problem underneath, underneath the block because the block is non-perpendicular. So even for, for the producers, we have to put the blocks on better or make an adjustment or reapply them so we don't cause a problem on the other side. So the action plan, time trimming, you know, we need to look for lame cows every day. You know, it doesn't have to be the manager. I can teach anybody on the farm how to spot a lame cow if it's in my job description. Go and listen to Tom. I think he's on one more time. Okay? Huge important, as you guys' as farms grow, you can't be everywhere. 
I can teach the Hispanics, I can teach the Filipinos on how to, sp I've got some of the Hispanics there that, Carl, she's lame. Boss is through there, gets out the, gets out the cows and he comes back. Did the boss bring 737? No, oh, she, she needs to be looked at. See, if, you, if we help those guys, if we cheat them guys, they actually will, you know, they feel important. I was at a large farm uh, in April. We did some stockmen and milker training. I just spent a couple hours with them explaining what the importance was of detecting lame cows. Guess what happened the next morning? 20 lame cows on the list on a Saturday morning, right? But it worked. And I talked to them just this week. It's going great. 3,000 cow dairy, they're having about two or three lame cows a week right now because the maintenance is working and once we got caught up with the, with the emergency ones, you know, it, it, it got better. So, and for me, every lame cow is urgent. It's urgent care. Can't wait. The longer we wait, the more the damage, the more it takes for her to recover. The more likely she's going to come and see me again. You know, that's a frequent flyer. Some cows got just as many miles as I have. You know? And then tracking those high maintenance cows. So, a few more, just a few more. We can go through here. With ditchy too, the earlier we treat it today, those, those early lesions, the better chance we ever have that, that, they, that they become back to normal healthy skin. If we just wait an extra five, six days, a lot of times we've lost the battle. And I'm seeing that. So foot baths, important part, time budgets and cooling. And we got to construct facilities for cows. It's a place the other day, ah, oh, we're going to rip the sand, we're going to take the, the sand out, we're going to put mattress in because it's too much work to clean the stalls. Guess what? Guess what's going to happen to lameness? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So when I look at my low lameness herds, time functional trimming, they're superb in lameness identification. They do lame cow care every day. They have an action plan. How many of you guys got a plan in the office what you're doing with a lame cow? Or who is responsible to pick out the lame cow? And the other thing I'm finding with those guys, they don't tolerate it. I mean, I've, I've got a couple, three guys, if there's a lame cow on a Sunday morning, she gets done before they go to church. Because he, he, he can't stand it. But guess what? The vet goes there, he says, Carl, he says, I don't know what the heck they're doing. We do herd health, 14 out of 15, 17 out of 19, 12 out of 13, all the time. And for me, I, I go there, 220 cows, I put about one or two blocks on a month, every two months. Milking 95 pounds twice a day, not bad. You know, all we ever talk about when I go there is, What's a good place to invest money? <laughs> That's what those guys talk about the whole time. And it was worse so before, before 2008. Those guys did all their own investing. They averaged a 12 to 16% return on their investment during that, but they lost a shit pile of money after that. <laughs> so, you know, records, I think, are an important thing. There's, there's some programs on the market. If we can't analyze what's happening on the farm with days and milk and all those type of things, we can't make wise decisions. See, again here, we have a lot of hemorrhaging there at that 120, uh, 140 to 170 days. I don't even know which farm it is, but it just gives me some, it gives me some answers here, okay? We can actually look at it. Conclusion, un unacceptable lameness levels are affecting profits. We, we have too much lameness. And it can, it, it, we can do better, we can do much better. If we do some time trimming or just do more regular, okay? Pay attention to details. Accountability. For me, if a trimmer goes in between the toes or goes around the walls, one warning, the second time it's a pink slip. 
I don't know what's his, what is in the UK. Pink slip too? Huh? Red card. Red card. Okay, it's a red card. The problem is, right, sometimes it's hard to replace them. But, you know, I've done it, and I was able to change. Okay, no lameness tolerance, and remember, animal welfare, cows first. Okay, so just here, uh, sand herd, okay, dry cow trim. You can see just a little bit of a, a dark spot in, a, in the white line, but not a problem because we're on sand. We have like a 1% white line lesion incidence on this 600 cow dairy. And, and for me on a back foot, I, I use the knife all the time because thinning that inner wall out reduces the fibromas, opens it up more, and, and just keeps the ditchy out of the way. Even though this one had a, had a chronic ditchy, but it was, she, wasn't, she didn't have a problem. So, you guys, uh, you know, the hit target, and, and, and I had another video here, but we couldn't get it to play. So, this was a farm, horrible ditchy problem. We did a reconstruction and, and we changed the footpath. Look at that, one, one, Two, three, four, five, oh. So three dunks and two dunks. I, I, the more I can see three dunks, the better results I have, okay? But look at the traffic through that footpath. You see cows stopping and shitting? No. Because when a cow gets into a race, all she can think about is the daylight up front. The cheapest investment this farm made. I'm not going to lie to you. This was after 220 cows are milked. Look at how much manure there is at the end of the milking. People said it can't be done. We're using 200 liters of water, and they actually run two milkings in a row with the same solution. We have superb results. So. What, what, I, what, what, I, what I mean with that is there's things we, we know we can get done. And guess what? These guys are saving today about 50 to 70% of the money on the footpath solutions. Because we, we built the bat 50 centimeters wide, 3 meters 60 long, and I probably go, I probably on a bigger herd, I probably go 4 meters long today. Just to get, because the, it has shown that the length is better the length is better than, than, than anything else, okay? And then here, I'm actually done here. We'll take questions. It's, I'm just going to let this play here. People can watch. I'm going to take some questions. What's the best solution for putting foot pass? Depends. The, it's the digital dermatitis. Not have it. No, I'm just so he asked, what's the best, solu uh, what's the best solution to put in the foot bath? Hygiene. If the feet are clean, the box can't grow. Okay? So when we reproduce the disease in a controlled environment, we took healthy steers, cut into their skin, put the cultures on there, nothing happened. The next thing they tried is they put tape around their feet, put them in rubber boots, soaked them with water twice a day, put the cultures on them, seven days later they had ditchy growing. The dirtier the feet are, the more likely they're going to go. So don't think a disinfectant is always going to work. If the feet are dirty, disinfectant isn't working. So it depends. If something is working, what's generally, we know today that a 2.5% copper sulfate works great. Okay? It seems like it keeps them at, at that even. Uh, it keeps them at that stage where they're at the chronic stage, it keeps them under control. They don't blow up on us. For me, what we're seeing today is if we can keep it, keep it from developing in the heifers, we might not have to use a foot bath. Okay? We might not have to use a foot bath. So I'm not a big proponent of formalin unless it can be completely automated and it's away from, from the people that have to smell it. Because it's, it's, it's wicked stuff. And, and 
most people, if you got employees, you got to think about that, okay? It's great stuff. One of the things about formalin, less is more. Less is more. The more, stronger you use it, the more you bake them, the more you pickle them, the more you have to use it. So for me, one and a half percent with a four meter bath gives me the best results. Okay? Anything okay, ne else? Next question. Can, we, can you use the mics and just give your name? And yeah. No other questions. Oh. Um, with inspecting heifers pre carving, I, my biggest concern would be there would be a lack of thickness to do any modeling on the lateral claw. But so that would be my what I'd be most nervous about. So what's your experience of how much to do to them? If, if, they're, if they're grazed, probably there isn't much. But every heifer before they calf, the inside claw is long, right? If you look at them, the inside claw always points more forward on every heifer in the back. I'm talking about the back. If you can shorten that point up a little bit, you increase that angle generally five degrees. That's where the foot, feet and leg score comes from. If you don't do it, it works short, but you lose the heel along with it. And with the modeling, three to six weeks before calving, if it gets a little soft in the model area, she doesn't become lame because you're putting the weight on the, under the support system on the outside. You know? Even, I, I, every occasionally I, I bleed one a little bit. I never get them back. Because, you bleed them because you go too far into the toe. So the modeling, remember, them. if you saw my pictures, I didn't model into the toe triangle. It, the modeling is all done in the typical sole ulcer side and out. So that's, that's where it comes with the grinder. We have to be really careful because if you take that grinder, you come all the way down to the toe, you're gonna have, you're gonna have necrotic toes. Um, just on that point as well, some experts believe that we can get over obsessed with matching the toe length up because there could be deviation in the actual um, end of the bone on the leg that could present the toes at different lengths. Yeah. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> because because uh, actually what I'm seeing, I'm seeing just the opposite. As the farms get larger, the bones get smaller because more traumatic, walking further, they don't develop as they don't don't develop as much, and all the feet they looked at were for, were for front feet. I don't worry about the front feet. The front feet they can be big, but it's the back feet that matters. So, on the back feet, that's that's even. Uh, I work with two farms, two largest freestallers in Australia, and the mating guy from ABS was in there three years ago, and he says, Carl, he says, how come the two largest farms with the most the worst conditions freestalls have by far the best feet and leg score in all Australia. I says, because we look at every heifer that comes on the dairy. Just an inspection. Sometimes it doesn't take much. You know, if they're in a good environment, you know, all sometimes it's just modeling that outside call. It depends on the breeds. Like what I found is in, in, in New Zealand and Southern Australia where the conditions are wet, even the jerseys are short. Now you go into New South Wales where it's drier, the jersey toes are always long. And if we shorten them up on those jerseys, we have a better foot angle all the way through. Next question, please. One more, way, way in the back. Uh, Peter Dowell, uh, we're seeing an increasing amount of uh, rubber mats being put in uh, feed uh, passageways and cubicle. <laughs> Pastor uh, I wonder if you can give your, me your opinion of uh, those in uh, helping to prevent lameness. Ah, this is my opinion. And some other people's too. If you got a cow laying down, it doesn't matter what you have. I use rubber for reducing wear. That's where it's the most important. Reduce the wear, like on larger farms. I have a farm in 1998 when we built it, we put rubber in three of the pens and one not. Guess what? Three pens with rubber, we always bring more lame cows out of it. Because when it's hot or the sh because we got a mat, if we have sand, yeah. But for me, the most important part is if you got a laying down cow, you got a healthy cow. If you got a standing cow, you got a lame cow. 
and you guys can do your own test. If you take, if you look at your, your finger, take your finger, put pressure up against it. See here? It's all white on the point. So if a cow stands, circulation is impaired. So even if she stands on rubber, for me, laying, if, if I got a laying down cow, I got healthy cows and I got milk. You go in those herds that do 44, over 40 liters, 12 to 14 hours a day, they're laying down. And it can be done, it can be done with mattresses or, or it can be done if the stalls are right. So for me, I don't like them in, 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 the, in the feed alleys because I think it makes, okay, do I, if I have a choice, uh, do I want to go and lay in an uncomfortable stall or I want to stay on the rubber? Of course it's easier, to, more comfortable to stand on the rubber. But it, is it the best? It's not for the cow. You know? So invest your, if you invest your money in, 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 in the stalls, guess what? You're going to Spain once a year with the extra money you're making. <laughs> like, like when it's like miserable in Scotland or up here, you know, you just go, go down to Spain, take a little beach vacation with the family. That's, that's what it is. So w reducing wear. Okay, any other questions? We've got probably time for one I, more. Again, for the people that want to come out, we still have room this afternoon. I think tomorrow morning's workshop is full, right? Yeah, tomorrow morning. Is full. So this afternoon we have extra spaces. And, and uh, anything here is if you guys want to find me, that's usually where you can find me. Okay. Yeah. We, it's, it's getting to be a big problem, especially in, uh, if this, uh, so the question was, do you find with some of those big sand herds, you have excessive wear? It's a huge problem. Huge problem on the bigger farms. Because remember, you got five mils a month, five millimeters a month. And if you got coarse sand, and they're walking a long ways, uh, it's, uh, you don't have enough to go around the end. Even though I, I was in a large dairy with rubber in all the passageways, we still couldn't keep the feet on them. So it's, for me, there's, there's a limit how big we can go because the limit is the five mils a month and, and the coarseness of the sand, you know? Sand is, sand is the gold standard, but you know, uh, probably 4,000 cows on sand, it's probably not, it's probably gonna, unless you have a really fine sand, you know? <clears throat> it's not going to work. There's, there's a lot of, there's places where, where we put soles on them, plastic soles, so just keep them walking, you know? Okay, I think we'll, okay. we'll, we'll leave it there and take a break for lunch. Um, so we're going to have lunch now. It'll be served both in, um, through in the uh, um, marquee um, and also through in the dining room as well, I believe. So if you want to take a break there. So thank you very much. Um, if you can show appreciation as well. <laughs>